Hey everybody, this is a build guide for the NASKiller version 3.0. Um, I wanted to create a small desktop slash rack mount NAS ready for 8 terabyte drives that are probably going to go on sale during the holiday season. Uh, Black Friday, you know, Christmas sales. I, I think that the 8 terabytes are going to get near $115. Um, we'll see. And that includes the Western Digital. 8 terabyte easy store my book elements um, the Seagate SMR backup drives are usually a little bit cheaper um, but I think we can expect those to be pretty cheap this holiday season we've already seen them down to like the 130 130 dollar range um, so yeah this is the motherboard for the NAS killer version 3.0 um, it's a little bit different than the NAS killer 2.0 um, it's a much smaller form factor. This is SSI CEB, which is basically ATX, but it's got about three quarters of an inch. Uh, it's about three quarters of an inch longer than ATX. And um, this is the front of the board. Here's the back where the IO shield goes. Here's the top and here's the bottom. So it does limit case compatibility a little bit. The Cooler Master N400, unfortunately, uh, does not support this board. There's a little bit of a, like a ridge towards the front end where the board doesn't sit properly. Um, so we've gone for the Antec 300 version 2, and that supports six drives plus two solid states plus three five and a quarter inch bays, which you can convert to whatever you want. So it's got a good amount of drive support. And it's not too expensive, I think it's around $60, $62. So this board's pretty cool. Um, it doesn't have all the features of the NAS Killer version 2, but it is dual socket. So it's got 13 or LGA 1366, which means it supports 5500, 5600 series processors. In order to support 5600 series, you do have to update, update the BIOS. And luckily, the seller of this motherboard includes two E5506 or similar processors and basically they're like socket protectors so they're already installed and <laughs> they're already installed and uh, they just protect the sockets but they're good for if you just need to get it up and running and you don't need anything special processor wise you can use them um, but they are kind of old and not very power efficient I've already updated the BIOS. There's a guide on that, on how to do that in the download section of this motherboard on serverbuilds.net. And it's super, super simple. Um, but I've already updated the BIOS using these and I've got dual L5630s in there, which are quad cores. I would not recommend going above L5640s. And the reason why is that this motherboard only has one EPS connector, which is a good and a bad thing. It means that you don't need an EPS splitter, but it also means that you're limited with the amount of power that can be delivered to the two sockets. So this board is really just about, I mean, there's like a lot of trade-offs with this board. The EPS situation is one of them, uh, which means that you're kind of limited. I wouldn't really run anything outside of the L series or the lower end E series higher end E series or X series, I, you might run into power delivery issues. Um, the other limitation is that it's dual channel only, which means that you don't get your, you know, up to triple channel, which you would normally expect with this. Again, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, Intel also states that it's max supported RAM is 32 gig. I don't necessarily think this is true especially with the 5600 series i i have a suspicion that it's probably 64 gig is the max um, but i don't unfor unfortunately i don't have the 8 gig 6 necessary to test that um, so if i get them i'll try to test it and update the guide as possible but um, right now i'm going to just say that the limit's 32 gig so it means eight four gig sticks right now i've got four four gig six in here 16 gig i mean that's plenty for a nas 
and usually I just recommend 8 gig, especially if you're trying to keep the, uh, the cost down. One of the other issues slash trade-offs is that due to the socket position, you can see both sockets are on the front of the board where, excuse me, all of the other guides, you notice that normally CPU 2's here and CPU 1's here. Um, really this board's just designed for rack mount servers and like 1U and 2U servers where you have both heat sinks at the front and you see the RAM is in line with the airflow. So you have the air flowing from here to the back and uh, it keeps both of the CPUs really cool. But in an ATX desktop setting, it's not really the best orientation. Um, and it does cramp things a little bit, especially with the PCI Express expansion back here. So keep that in mind. And then the other issue is that there's a black heat sink in between the sockets. So if you're, if you're using the Antec case, you're going to have to use some sort of active cooling because there's no fans in the front and to push air across these heat sinks. So you would have to use an Arctic 12, but the issue with the Arctic 12 is that you can only mount it in this orientation. And if you think about it, air is typically flowing from the front to the back, but with the Antec case, it's not too big of a deal. There is a top exhaust. There's a 140 that sits about here, which means that your airflow would be going from the bottom to the, through the top. And that black heat sink is what pre prevents it from being mounted this, this direction. You won't be able to use these with the Rosebowl case if you decide to go the rack mount option because not only is it perpendicular airflow, the Rosewell has 120 fans on this side blowing this way, but these are completely blocked off. You see the fins are bent. So no airflow is going to get through this way. It really just creates an, like a non-ideal situation. There is a way to remedy that, though. You can use the Dynatron G785 coolers. They are active coolers, and they're like a, they look like an Intel stock heat sink. And they just have a, top, a fan on the top, and it blows air down. Um, but they are more expensive. They're about $10 more expensive than the Arctics, which are, the Arctics are 20 bucks. The Dynatrons are 30 bucks. And uh, these passive ones, which are 2U passive heat sinks from Supermicro, they are, they, I think they're about $16, but they would totally work fine with the Rosewell. So you have three, three different heat sink options. One works only with the Rosewell. One works only with the Antec. And then, of course, the most expensive one works with either. Um, but just something to consider. As far as PCI Express, PCI Express expansion goes, we've got three X8 physical slots. I think one of these is X8 electrical. I think these two are X4 electrical. And then you have an X4 physical. And I believe this is X1 electrical. And then you have PCI. Uh, standard PCI and six SATA two right here at the bottom. So if you want to, if you want to use like a solid state and run full speed with trim and everything like that, you're gonna have to get an add-in card. In the build guide, there's a two-port add-in card and there's a four-port add-in card. I think they are fourteen and twenty-eight dollars respectively. Uh, so not too expensive. And. On the back, we have dual NIC with USB 2.0, 4 USB 2.0, VGA, and COM. From everything I've read about this board, and I haven't had a chance to test it yet, this board has um, Intel's IPMI on it. And it, I believe it routes through one of these ports, but I also believe that both of these are usable as standard Ethernet ports, so you might need to play around with the BIOS a little bit to get these both working. Definitely one of them is a standard Ethernet port. Um, I don't think it has a dedicated IPMI port, but um, I'll update the guide if I find that out. So yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it's a pretty good board. It's, like I said, it's capable. It's, uh, it's very cheap. The seller has it for $41 or best offer, accepted my uh, $35 offer instantly 
um, and free shipping. So that was super awesome. Again, it comes with two processors already and a IO shield, which most of the other builds didn't come with. So it's a, it's a pretty good build and there's definitely a lot of trade-offs from the NAS killer version too, but it is smaller. I mean, just a little bit different. Um, I wanted to get a cheap NAS out there for those of you that are looking to buy some hard drives and add some storage. If I were actually building this into a working NAS, personally, I do the um, I do the Antec case, 16 gig of RAM, just like I have here, a couple of Arctic 12s, and I've got dual L5630s in there right now, which are quad core low power. I think they're only four dollars each. Uh, super awesome processors. They run super cool. Power consumption is really, really low. I think this board with those processors, um, if I remember correctly, I was testing this last night. It was using about 102 watts at the wall with an 80 plus bronze power supply. It's only running a 400 watt power supply. Now, that sounds like a lot, but that was in the BIOS and I wasn't booted into an operating system yet. And so when you boot into an operating system, the power management features kick on where they don't in the BIOS. So I would expect that you'd be looking at it probably 70 to 80 watts um, in, inside of an operating system like Windows or something like that. So th that's pretty good for a dual CPU. And uh, yeah, you could even lessen it by using more dense RAM and only using two sticks versus four, things like that. Um, I have a selection of expansion cards here. This is a 9201-16E, which is good for adding a DAS and connecting a DAS to your system. It's got four external SAS ports. Um, just want to show you that this guy does fit in and clears the heat sink just fine. Here's a 9201-8I for 8x internal SAS or SATA ports. Um, this one does fit in as well. It's going to be a little close with the cables. And turn the uh, turn the board so you can see. There's plenty of room for cables, but it's going to be close, um, especially if you're using these bigger block heat sinks. If you're using the Dynatrons, it, you'll have plenty of room. Um, and then I've got the Sun Oracle F80. F40 is the exact same size, so if you want to use one of these, um, I mean, it just fits in there really nicely. But the only limitation with the PCI Express is that there's no cutout on the back of any of these X8 slots. So that means you're not putting in any standard GPU and you are length restricted. So unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to put a GPU in the system, but if you're just using it as a NAS for free NAS, Unraid, things like that, even Windows Server or Ubuntu Server, uh, you'll be totally fine. You don't need a GPU. Um, just like all of my other builds, you can put a GPU in in those, but I don't recommend it. I don't I don't have GPUs in my servers. I don't I don't find a need for it personally. Um, yeah, it's a cool little board. It's got plenty of expansion. It's got dual CPUs. Um, it's very, very cheap, which is my favorite part about it, honestly. And, yeah. Uh, just looking at the board here and seeing if there's anything else I missed. I'll move these guys out of the way. Um, for those of you that need to worry about fan headers and stuff, there's two in the front here in front of CP1 two in front of CPU two. There's also a blue one in the back right here. Um, so there's plenty of fan headers. And I think that, that about covers it. So if you have any questions about this board, feel free to ask. Um, ask in the comments below or ask on Reddit, ask on Discord, um, and someone will try to help you out. I'll do my best to help you out too. Um, I, like I said, I wanted to get this out there for the holiday season so that I know that the uh, NAS Killer V2 is out of stock. The anniversary build is a lot more expensive than this guy. Uh, you can go single CPU with this 
for I think like $171. I mean, that's, I mean, all said and done with the power supply and everything. Could be even less than that if you go for like an EVGA B stock power supply. And those could be as low as $10 uh, versus the $30 one I have listed. So it's very, very budget oriented, but it makes a NAS that's completely ready for eight terabyte drives, pretty much however many you can fit. Um, and then you can also add a DAS later if you need to add more. So hopefully that covers everything I need to with this board. And uh, I hope it's okay that I didn't do exactly a tabletop build like I did with the other ones. If you have questions about how to build LGA 1366, like putting the processors in the sockets and stuff like that, check out one of the other tabletop guides. Um, I think I have three different 1366 tabletop builds, so should be plenty, uh, plenty of info as far as that's concerned. Thanks for checking out the video. Uh, like I said, feel free to hit me up. I'll do my best to answer all of your questions. And uh, yeah, that's it. Happy holidays, everybody.